And so my presentation today is going to be, uh, you know, what I saw over the course of several months um, in, in West Africa. I was in Burkina Faso and, and Ghana uh, in 2014. And, and the background was that I actually went there to write about Canadian mining. I had gotten a fellowship uh, to travel and look at big Canadian mining operations and, and see what impact that they had on the people uh, who lived in and around them. And um, hopefully if everyone can see the photo that I've put up on the screen here, it's, it's a photo of um, Essakan, which is you know, on the edge of the Sahara Desert in, in Northern Burkina Faso. And it's the largest open pit gold mine in all of Africa. It's run by a Canadian mining company called I Am Gold. And, and this is a photo that was taken just on a plane ride in, into, the, um, into the mine compound. And to give you a sense for just how massive this thing is, it's, it's uh, about a kilometer and a half end to end and almost a kilometer deep, about eight, eight 900 meters deep. And it is just an absolutely massive, hole in the ground and, and they the, the territory up there is quite volatile um, you know lawless and, and everything else and so the security situation is such that they they essentially run an autonomous little village up there they have a a, a secure compound that they literally fly in and out of and, and you don't leave the compound because um, I'm not sure if everyone remembers, but, you know, there have been a lot of kidnappings and, and, and various things. So it's not safe to leave the compound. And, and I was flown in by the company to go and take a look at this thing. And it was from from the point of an outsider who's never really spent a lot of time at a mining site. It was amazing. I mean, they had a gymnasium, air conditioned gymnasium. They had these wonderful um places where the workers lived, they were able to, uh, you know, they had cafeterias and great food and all sorts of other things. And, and you know, they, were, they had some of the best uh, workplace health and management that you would ever see in Africa. I mean, it, it, it felt like we were in Canada again with the, the level of rigor that was going on. But what was really amazing, and this is what I didn't anticipate, is when I flew back out of this compound, I really realized if I want to talk to the people who live in and around this mine, I'm going to have to go back, but not by plane this time. And so I drove back a few days later just to get to the other side of the fence because, of course, they wouldn't let me out. And when I got back to the same side of the fence, this is only a few hundred meters from the perimeter fence of that mine. And it is where the artisanal miners set up. And as you can see, there are just holes dug into the ground and little shelters all over the place. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these pits dug just meters from the border fence of one of the most advanced technological mines in the world. And here, it's like you've gone back in time. These are the most rudimentary, um, dangerous, and, and, and frankly, toxic uh, conditions you could ever imagine where the artisanal miners work. And when we first were walking around, there wasn't anyone there. There was no one there. And, and this man just popped out of a hole. And he came out and he had a, a flour sack with him filled with rocks. And this is his photo here. His name's Mamadou Diko. And, and Mamadou, you know, as you can see in this photo, he's barefoot. He's not wearing gloves. He's got a, a flashlight attached to his head with an er elastic band. And, and he goes down these hand dug pits and you can't really get a sense for how deep they go, but it's astonishing. They, they go more than a hundred feet underground. I think 60, 70 meters is what they were saying. So it's, they go down and down and down and down and down. And in the dry season, everything is hard like a rock. But when the rains start, um, these things can collapse and, and dozens of miners are killed every year in these, in these holes when they, when they collapse and they're down there. So it, it's incredibly dangerous work it's stressful, it's claustrophobic. And we went down one of these holes with Mamadou to, to see how he operated. And, and I mean, it, it, like I said, it was the most unbelievably rudimentary setup I'd ever seen. He had a little hammer, he'd whack the side of the wall for a while until he broke off rocks. And then he would put them in his sack and bring them back to the surface. And, you know, for this, he might on a good day make $5. And, and that puts him in the, in, you know, the upper, um, the upper echelons of what you can make uh, for an uneducated sort of untrained person in Burkina Faso. So he considered himself pretty lucky. But from, from an outside perspective, I, I couldn't believe the conditions he was working in. Here, here's just a, a close up shot of his hands. You know, there's blood on his knuckles from where he's climbing up and down. And he's, you know, literally just got a piece of string holding his pants up. 
and 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 it was that contrast between the industrial mine on one side and then just a few hundred meters away the um the artisanal miners working on the other side and and here's an example of the, how nice it was to work for the mine so so the mine did hire local people and, and and a lot of the truck drivers and the miners were local burkina bay people who worked there and, and like i said i mean they got they've got safety boots and hard hats and they drive these amazing you know 150 ton trucks and they have great you know great salaries and everything else but of course there's not enough jobs for everybody and so one of the big complaints in and around when i spoke to people in the village was sure some people are working in the mine and that's great for them but the rest of us end up having to go down the holes and, and dig dig you know as if it was the, the the middle ages so we went back to sort of see how they processed the gold and and a single person can't really get the gold out of the rocks and so what all the artisanal miners do is they in this little village they kind of work together and you bring your rocks to a, a, a like a gasoline powered rock crusher and they crush it up into um into a sort of a fine dust and then they pan it just pan panning gold like it was the 19th century and when they pan the gold you can uh zoom in and you know a whole bag of rocks might reduce down to this much gold in the bottom of a pan so it's 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 a very difficult living uh you know being an artisanal miner and and that end of the business isn't so toxic if you know if i was to say so it's more just the danger and the and the hard work and the grueling labor but um i continued on this reporting journey and about 500 kilometers south of here i crossed the border into to ghana and the um you know the environment changed and it, i went from being in the desert uh to being in the jungle and here it's you know it's humid it rains all the time it's it, it's tropical jungle but they have the same issues you know they have a lot of in, um artisanal mining and here is where i stumbled across artisanal refining and so this is a little hut uh just on the edge of town in, in northern uh, ghana and in this hut i met a man named collins ofi bonsu and he is the artisanal refiner and just i wanted to walk you through closely what how how he refines gold um, on this artisanal level and so local artisanal miners will bring him their gold and then for a small fee he'll uh, essentially um, refine it for them to get it up to a, sort of a 97 98 99 percent um, uh, purity where they can then sell it and so this is how he starts he, he he has a little metal bowl and he shoots some acid into that bowl i think it's nitric acid it might be boric acid i'm not 100 sure um but from that bowl he then sticks the bowl into an open fire and again i want to draw your attention to the fact that if you look at his feet he's wearing flip-flops if you look at his hands you see he's not wearing gloves and if you look at his face his protection is a t-shirt wrapped around his face and you can see the smoke just billowing right out um and so whatever contaminants were in that gold it's often mercury or whatever that is put in the gold to 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 clump it together at the um in the initial stages right when you're mining it um here he's just breathing that smoke right in in the fire the, the next step is he puts it into a little a little crucible here and he adds borax and he sticks it in the fire and a few minutes later it's blazing hot and it comes right out and he pours it out and there it is there's a piece of gold refined in burkina faso by a or excuse me in ghana by collins bonsu who was a um, artisanal miner an artisanal refiner and i guess i just wanted to show you that that little hut uh that i showed you earlier was right on the edge of a schoolyard and and it doesn't get more stark than this so here he was burning mercury and refining gold and this is when you look out his front door this is what you see it's a little school and you look across the field and there are children running barefoot and playing soccer and of course immediately after refining the gold for me he uh took all the byproducts and dumped them right out on the ground immediately in front of his cabin right where these children were playing so i i that was my little experience of artisanal mining but you know my understanding is it's very reflective of um how this industry goes on around the world and and if i was to make a few remarks before i, I finish off it, it's just to say about how gold is an element it's completely untraceable and when it's 
refined down, as you saw in this way, it gets sort of sold into the world gold supply where it becomes completely indistinguishable from gold that is um, produced environmentally responsibly or by a big industrial mine with all the safety and environmental protections that go along with that. And so as a result, it's really impossible for any end consumer to understand where the gold that they're buying is coming from, whether that is in electronics or whether that's in jewelry. It, this kind of gold, you know, some of the estimates say it's up to 20% of the world's gold comes from artisanal mining. And there's been a lot of efforts around the world to improve uh, the practices of artisanal miners. But, you know, speaking to these people and trying to understand why they do what they do, uh, you know, it, it's quite simple. It's they, they, they have no other way to support themselves and it's economic necessity that pushes them to do these kinds of things. And, um, and, and that's kind of where I wanted to leave it. I, I imagine there'll be lots of questions, but I, uh, I thought that that was the best I could do uh, trying to keep it short enough. And, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening.